This video is sponsored by HelloFresh. When people in ancient Egypt prepared for death, those who had the means often built spacious tombs for themselves, with the interior walls painted with scenes of people, objects, and experiences that were most important to them during their life on Earth. Such colorful scenes adorning the walls of their tombs communicated to the gods the type of life that they hoped to live after death. Assuming that they hadn't sinned, and that the judgment of the gods was in their favor, for the ancient Egyptians, death was simply a stepping stone to another life in the spiritual world. This desired life was portrayed in the scenes painted on the walls of countless tombs, many of which included food, drink, and great banquets with family and close friends. Egyptians delighted in feasting with their loved ones, and they wanted this to continue in the afterlife. The art on these walls envisioned the ideal. In reality, very few Egyptians lived such lives. However, the average Egyptian ate and drank much better than his or her contemporaries in other parts of the world. In this program, we're going to explore one of the most important and enjoyable aspects of daily life in antiquity, specifically food and drink in ancient Egypt. Unlike many parts of the world, the land of Egypt was arguably one of the best places for agriculture in antiquity. This was due, of course, to the Nile River, which, depending on the rains in Ethiopia, much further to the south, was predictable in that it flooded annually and never really changed course throughout the recorded history of Egypt. This was not the case, for example, in ancient Mesopotamia, where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, along with their many branches and tributaries, could considerably shift course over the span of just a few decades. That's why today you have the ruins of great cities such as Ur and Uruk in the middle of the desert, tens of miles away from the nearest riverbed. The steady flow of water provided by the Nile to the farmlands and fish-filled marshes of Egypt meant that for the most part, the average Egyptian could eat relatively well in comparison to most other peoples. This fact becomes even more impressive when you consider the country's massive population, perhaps as many as 3 million people at the height of the New Kingdom in the 13th and 14th centuries BC. Egyptian records dating to the reign of Ramesses II indicate that one year there was such a surplus of cattle that the great pharaoh donated approximately half a million cows just to the temple establishment. Excess grain was also given to the many people living in the cities and villages throughout Egypt. Of course, such good fortune was not always the case, and it's important to remember that not everyone sampled and enjoyed the same cuisine. Most farmers and craftsmen rarely, if ever, ate beef. This was not due to some cultural taboo or religious conviction, but because it was simply just too expensive. On average, one cow could cost the equivalent of the annual income of a craftsman or the yearly harvest of a small farmer. A goat was a bit cheaper, perhaps one-tenth the cost. Still, such meat was a rarity for most and only eaten on special occasions. For example, a wedding or to celebrate the birth of a child. However, for the wealthy and political establishment, there was no limit to the amount of meat that they could consume, especially beef. Certain types of cows weren't eaten because they were considered to have been sacred, but many others didn't have such status or protection. Other bovines were offered as sacrifices to particular deities and then, after certain rituals were performed, feasted upon. Writing in the 4th century BC, the Greek traveler and historian Herodotus describes such an act. When they skin a bull, they pronounce a prayer over all the intestines they have removed, but leave the rest of them and its fat in the body. Then they cut off the legs, 
the tip of its loins, the shoulders, and the neck. When they have finished this task, they fill the remaining cavity of the bull's body with bread they consider pure, and with honey, raisins, figs, frankincense, myrrh, and other fragrant substances. When it is filled completely, they burn up the entire carcass, all the while pouring oil over it copiously. They fast before they sacrifice, and while the victim is burning, they beat their breasts in mourning. But when they have finished beating their breasts, the entrails that remained are served as a meal. Although the average Egyptian didn't regularly eat beef or goat meat, these animals were still necessary for their milk. Egyptians were known to have consumed more milk than any other people of the ancient world. Thus, a family, or even a village, might keep a cow or two, or perhaps a few goats, specifically for their milk. Scholars have long debated if eating animals associated with certain popular deities was considered taboo in Egyptian society. For example, pigs were associated with the god Set, and it's believed that his fervent devotees refrained from eating pork for this reason. That being said, there's a lot of evidence indicating that pork was widely eaten by many in Egypt, and so its restriction didn't apply to everyone. Along with domesticated animals, wild animals also provided food, though on a more irregular basis. Ancient Egyptian paintings from all periods depict many species that roamed areas that today are arid deserts. Thus, at that time, there were probably more gazelle, antelope, ibex, addux, and deer that could be hunted than today. Before horses were brought to Egypt, wild animal hunts generally consisted of groups of men, often accompanied by dogs, that would chase and steer their prey into a netted area. Other times, the dogs would be used to chase the hunted animal toward a group of men who would then fire a volley of arrows to bring the beast down. So speaking of food, let's come back to the year 2021 so that I can take a few moments to thank the sponsor of this video, HelloFresh. For those of you unfamiliar with it, HelloFresh provides pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes that are delivered right to your doorstep making home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. The holidays can be hectic, but HelloFresh helps to keep things simple with recipes and ingredients that cut out grocery store shopping and limit meal prep time so that you can spend more of the festive season with friends and family. There are plenty of family-friendly, calorie-smart, pescatarian, and veggie meals for everyone with new options every week. Plus, every recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers. HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients means there's less prep for you and less wasted food. Most meals take 20 minutes or less, like the delicious Italian chicken over lemony spaghetti that I made. Super easy and absolutely delicious. So go to HelloFresh.com and use the code HISTORYWITHSCI14 for up to 14 free meals and 3 free gifts. Check out the link in the video description. In many parts of the world today, meat and potatoes are considered to be staples of the average diet. In ancient Egypt, it was bread and beer. Both came from grain, which is why the flooding of the Nile was so vital to Egypt's agricultural-based economy. Without it, the country's food supply would be in peril. Egypt's two indigenous grains, barley and emmer wheat, which flourished in the hot climate, were cultivated on the flat, canaled, and well-watered fields along the banks of the Nile. When ready, the grains were harvested and then stored in beehive-shaped silos until needed. In order to create flour, the grain was pounded with a grinding stone that was usually round, though technically it could be in other shapes as well, as long as it got the job done. The flour was then made into dough, by adding water, kneading it, and then adding yeast to make it rise. The process was very similar to the way that dough is made today. After this, the dough was ready to be shaped for baking. Egyptian bakers were creative, 
and fashioned bread in a multitude of shapes, from the standard, round, and oval loaves, to those in the shape of a crescent moon, animals, birds, flowers, and sometimes, for special ceremonies, people. The bread could also be baked in a variety of ways. For example, over a flat stone heated by a fire, or special canonical stoves, much like Indian tandoori ovens today. Herbs and sometimes honey were also added to give the bread a bit more flavor. The importance of bread to the average Egyptian cannot be overstated. It was eaten at every meal, whether it was in the hut of a farmer or a feast in honor of the pharaoh. Usually toasted, poorer people traditionally ate bread with milk, while those from the upper echelons of society often stuffed it with roasted meat. Afterward, the meal was washed down with a drink, usually beer for farmers, and those from the equivalent of the working class, and wine for the wealthier classes, whether royalty, high-ranking officials, or priests. Many scholars believe that beer was invented in Egypt. It was the preferred drink, and not for the reasons that one might think. Sure, even then it could be intoxicating if one drank too much, since the alcohol content in a cup of beer was estimated to have been around 7%. Public intoxication, though, was extremely frowned upon. In a rather poetic passage, one Egyptian scribe wrote, Boast not that you can drink a jug of beer. If you speak, an unintelligible utterance issues from your mouth. If you fall down and your limbs break, there is no one to hold out a hand to you. Your companions in drink stand up and say, Away with that drunk! If there comes an order to question you, you are found lying on the ground like a child. So then, why was beer so important in the common man and woman's meal? Well, Egyptian beer not only had important nutrients, but thanks to the sanitizing effects of its alcohol content, it was generally much safer to drink than water, especially in the marshy areas of the Nile Delta region. In general, high-born and wealthy people didn't drink beer, as they considered it to be a beverage of the working class. Instead, they got their fix from wine. Due to the climate, cultivating grapes, especially in the Delta region, wasn't difficult. However, the process of creating wine was relatively labor-intensive, which we can see from the tomb paintings showing the age-old method of workers trampling on grapes in large vats to let the juice flow out. This juice was collected and then left in a warm environment where it would ferment due to the natural yeast found on the grape skin. Then, as now, the older the wine, the better it tasted. And this, along with the manufacturing process just described, ultimately made it a luxury that only wealthy elites could indulge in. Those who lived close to the Nile or around the oasis of Fayum also ate fish and birds, which became their primary sources of protein. Both were in abundant supply and relatively easy, even for those of the lower classes, to catch on their own. In fact, as the Nile's floodwaters receded from the land, fish often became trapped in the mud and could be gathered by hand in great quantities. Otherwise, more conventional means of catching them, such as with hooks, nets, and even spears, were used. The most popular fish for consumption were catfish and local species of perch that could sometimes weigh as much as 100 pounds, or about 45 kilos. In short, there were a lot of fish, and a good catch could often feed the average family for at least a month. Because of the warm climate, though, fish would spoil quickly soon after their capture, and so they were generally salted and dried in the sun until it was time to eat them. Afterward, they could be used in various dishes, such as shredded fish cakes, which were extremely popular in Egypt, especially during the Ptolemaic period. Other delicacies from the Nile included turtles and even crocodiles. Though less common, both were caught, salted, and prepared 
much like fish. Since it's on a major migratory route between Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa, every year hundreds of thousands, some estimate even millions, of birds arrived in Egypt, both before and after their long trek across the Mediterranean Sea. Combined with the local fowl, those living in ancient Egypt, especially in and around the Delta region, had their pick from a variety of birds. Ducks, geese, pigeons, doves, and other species were regularly consumed by rich and poor alike. Not just the birds, but the Egyptians also enjoyed eating their eggs. If they weren't growing grain, then Egyptian farmers grew small quantities of onions, garlic, celery, lettuce, radishes, different types of squash, cucumbers, and multiple varieties of beans, including fava beans, chickpeas, and lentils. So as we can see, ancient Egyptian cuisine, even for the less privileged, was diverse and relatively nutritious, especially in comparison to other ancient civilizations. That being said, there was always room for sweets, especially after a meal. Since they didn't have pure sugar, the ancient Egyptians learned how to cultivate bees and use honey as their main sweetener. This was then often added to bread and at times, cakes. As we saw at the beginning of this program, many of the scenes depicted in Egyptian tomb paintings and on other artifacts are of extravagant banquets. Such events were generally thrown by more well-to-do people. At a typical banquet, various courses would have been served, one after the other, not on plates, but in containers or ceramic bowls, along with cups of wine, all while music played and women danced in the background. Again, keep in mind that very few Egyptians dined this way. Most would have simply eaten a modest meal consisting of bread, beer, and perhaps some fish or vegetables to supplement them. The tomb paintings depict the ideal life that most Egyptians, regardless of their status or place in society, would have hoped to obtain in the afterlife. Such scenes almost universally include some sort of food and drink, which essentially shows that Egyptians of all walks of life enjoyed few things more than a good meal amongst their loved ones. So I hope that you now have a better idea of what ancient Egyptians ate and drank. Thanks so much for stopping by. I sincerely appreciate it. I'd also really like to thank GrandKick69, Yap de Graf, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, Daniel Allen, Danny Van Eck, YNXTV, Robert Morgan, Frank, Tim Lane, Sebastian Hurtado Correa, Brendan Redman, Faridun Dadachanji, Jimmy Daruwala, Sher Cam, Farhad Kama, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all future content. Check out the benefits to being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as listen to special audio programs on the History with Sai podcast. Thanks again, and stay safe.